Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Aquariums After Hours here in our Tech Engagement Gallery. My name's Jesse, and tonight I have the privilege of introducing you to our guest speaker, Tessa Danalesco. And uh, this is a live stream event, so for those of you that are watching in the comfort of your own homes, welcome to After Hours, and welcome to all of you that are here in person as well. So Tessa's going to be telling us a little bit about her history with the Vancouver Aquarium, as well as some of her work uh, with the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. So it's going to be a really great presentation, so uh, buckle up and get ready. And with that, I will pass it off to Tessa. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Jesse, can everyone hear me all right? Perfect. Well, thanks so much for being here. What an amazing evening. Uh, I'm really excited uh, that I get to share a little bit of my story tonight, uh, how I got to be here. And I'm going to talk about the program that I manage as well, the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. Has anyone here heard of the BC Cetacean Sightings Network? <laughs> Couple hands going up. Awesome. Has anyone here reported to the BC Cetacean Sightings Network? Big ups to Sheila over here for sure. Um, well, if, if, you ha if you haven't heard of it or if you haven't reported yet, I'm going to tell you all about that this evening. Uh, but I'm going to start my story in childhood, first and foremost. Uh, how many people here grew up wanting to be a marine biologist? Couple of hands going up, yeah, for sure. Uh, one of those hands is my partner, Andrew. He, in fact, grew up on the North Shore. Uh, and he even visited the aquarium, the marine mammal trainers here, uh, to talk about life as a marine mammal trainer. Um, he now works in business development for a tech company. Uh, but, uh, but it's not an uncommon dream here. Uh, for, for people who grew up on the coast, uh, I actually did not grow up thinking I would be a marine biologist. I grew up in Calgary. Uh, so as you can see in the photo here, I spent a lot of time exploring the mountains with my family. I went to horse camp in the summer, western of course. Um, and I also uh, played a lot of sports, which is super evident in this photo here. I don't know if you can see my t-shirt uh, and my Olympic roots hat circa 1998. Uh, but really that was my main focus when I was younger. Uh, it was really fortunate though that with my family we spent summer vacation on the coast, particularly in the Parksville area. Uh, and it was at that time that I really started to get very interested in the ocean. And uh, so combining sports and thinking about wanting to live on the coast, it became pretty easy for me when it was time to go to university uh, that the University of, the, of Victoria was the perfect choice for me because I could live the dream, right? I could surf and I could go to school. How much better can I get really than that? Uh, so I enrolled uh, in the, the Bachelor of Science program uh, at the University of Victoria, specifically the Combined Biology and Psychology program, uh, with the intention of becoming a sports medicine doctor. Um, but like many overachievers, I also enrolled in the co-op program as well. And it really was through that co-op program that I changed my focus and realized that I was actually much more interested in research. Like, I was like living planet Earth, you know, those awesome DVDs. Like, it was pretty cool. So here are a couple of photos of me in my co-ops, the top uh, photos you can see, I worked for the Institute for Bird Populations doing some bird banding uh, and studying songbirds. And then the bottom two photos, uh, I spent some time in Africa working as a research assistant on a project studying chakma baboons. Um, so yeah, that, that really sparked my passion and my interest in research. And I was one of the only students in my program who didn't apply for med school after I was done. Um, but uh, it looks like it's worked out, so that's positive. And, um, Looking at these pictures here, it's uh, no surprise I was single at that time as well. Uh, I'll tie this all into underwater Santa in a second, but essentially after I graduated um, from, from my undergrad degree, I moved to Vancouver in search of new adventure uh, and that research career. Uh, I, I was really lucky after I first moved here that I got hired uh, at Urban Outfitters and Urban Fair, so I was super urban. It was awesome, but my big break came a couple months after I moved here, uh, and I got my big break here at the Vancouver Aquarium in the sleepovers department. So I'd spend my nights uh, leading school groups, girl guides, boy scouts uh, through the aquarium, uh, and, and that was awesome. Uh, luckily, though, a few months after that, I got an opportunity to work in the interpretive delivery department, so I switched into being here in the daytime uh, and was on microphone doing a lot of the programs, just like you saw Derek outside uh, with the Beluga program. And I also got the chance to be an interpretive diver as well. So yes, that is me, Mr. Scuba Claus himself. Uh, it was really amazing inspiring kids and, and celebrating with them through the holiday season, although it didn't always go as planned. There was one time when I hopped in 
the exhibit, and instead of seeing these glowing faces, uh, I saw these looks of shock and horror. And it took me a couple of seconds to realize that my hat and my beard and my wig were actually floating several meters away from me. So I apologize to anyone's Christmas that I ruined that year. Um, but it was still uh, really a highlight, an amazing time. Uh, during the time that I was an interpreter, I actually also volunteered uh, with the Marine Mammal Research Program here at the aquarium, specifically with the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. Uh, after a couple of years of putting in my volunteer time there, I got the opportunity to coordinate the program, and that's the role that I've been in for the last two and a half years. Uh, the BC Cetacean Sightings Network is a conservation-based research program that studies cetaceans, which are dolphins, whales, and porpoises, uh, as well as sea turtles, which are not cetaceans. There are honorary citation sub but uh, but we collect uh how biodiverse the BC coast is when it comes to those species. In fact, our waters are home to over 23 species and populations of cetaceans and sea turtles. Unfortunately, though, there are some serious conservation concerns when it comes to those animals because 12 of those populations are listed as at risk under Canada's Species at Risk Act. Furthermore, studying these animals is incredibly challenging. If you think about BC coastline, it's incredibly vast. It's uh, often inaccessible in parts. And what that means is conducting regular scientific surveys is logistically complicated and really, really expensive. So with the Sightings Network, what we aim to do is actually empower people who are already on the water, spending time on the water or near the water, to help us collect this really valuable data. So we are an opportunistic Sightings Network that collects sightings of cetaceans and sea turtles from the entire coast of British Columbia, including down into Puget Sound and up in southeast Alaska. My favorite part about the Sightings Network is that absolutely anyone can participate, can fulfill that childhood dream of being a marine biologist. Uh, in fact, to date, we've had over 5,000 unique observers contribute their sightings. When we, try, when we add that all together over the program's 16-year history, that means we've collected over 95,000 sightings. And this is what those sightings look like, visualized on a map. It's a really powerful data set. Uh, having this information is really useful, but we can't lose sight of our goal, and that's to conserve these vulnerable populations. So the data is made available for different conservation-based research projects. Uh, we'll also make it available for environmental assessments, critical habitat mapping, recovery strategizing for species at risk. But we do a lot of really cool in-house analyses as well including uh, using GIS, or Geographic Information Systems. Do I have any fellow GIS nerds here tonight? Yeah, that's right. So one person, that's awesome. Um, but uh, essentially what we can do is we can use different models to look at our data. Uh, with this specific map, what we did uh, is we corrected our data for effort by modeling the distribution of observer effort on our coast and combining those with our raw opportunistic data. <sighs> Mouthful. If you're a little bit lost, don't worry. Basically what that means is this map right here, which shows you the relative abundance of humpback whales on our coast is really, really sexy. Like, look at that data. It's good data. As part of my job as well, I get, I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity sometimes to head out on the water as well, sometimes with uh, Sheila, part of the Vancouver Police Department's Marine Unit. Um, this is a photo that uh, I took of a recent visit of bigs or transient killer whales to English Bay. You might notice a very iconic rock in the background of that photo. Uh, I've also, for the past couple of years, been really, really fortunate to be invited by Fisheries and Oceans Canada to participate in their offshore marine mammal surveys as well. Uh, I just got back from one uh, on Monday, actually, this week. Uh, we headed out off the, offshore the west coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, this was a photo that I took last year. It's of a humpback whale. You'll notice there's no land in the background. We were way, way out there. Uh, but this is particularly special because if you notice the pectoral fin, which is that white thing you can see underwater, it's pretty common for humpbacks in the Atlantic to have white on their top of their pectoral fins, but in the Pacific that's quite rare. So as a cetacean nerd, this was pretty jazzy. I also do a lot of communications, media, and outreach in my job as well. This is an interview from uh, CBC that I did on killer whales last year. Uh, if there's any confusion, I'm the one on the right. Um, but, uh, but doing that communication, that outreach, is, is really, really inspiring. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of that tonight. I promise I'll get there. Uh, in fact, does anyone know what we're looking at in this picture here? 
Gray Whale, I heard it. Very impressive. Uh, just to, uh, to mix it up, I'll play the sounds that Gray Whales can make here. look a little bit like bongo playing rocks. They're actually really amazing. They have this beautiful kind of mottled skin that you can see in this image here. Uh, I also think they're cool because they're covered in barnacles and whale lice. So they're almost like floating communities. Um, and uh, it's really amazing to see, uh, to see gray, gray whales off of our coast. Uh, and, and of course, talk about these whale lice uh, as well. Um, but I'll, I'll launch into a little bit of species identification for you folks here today because all of you, I'm recruiting you right now to be observers for the BC Cetacean Sightings Network. So I'll start uh, small and talk about some of the, the smaller cetaceans that we can find off of our coast and get a little bit bigger as we go on. Uh, starting with harbor porpoises. Uh, we do see them here around Vancouver quite a bit actually, specifically near White Cliff Park or Lighthouse Park. Uh, they tend to be pretty shy, pretty inconspicuous though and stay away from people in boats. So they can be difficult to spot, but oftentimes what you'll see is that gray, small, triangular dorsal fin just come up above the surface, dip back down, uh, and that's usually what a sighting comprises of. Uh, but they are very neat cetaceans in any case. Uh, moving up just a little bit in size, we have doll's porpoises. They're almost the complete opposite uh, of, of harbor porpoises. No, they're not baby killer whales. Uh, they are their own species, um, but they tend to be quite a bit more social. You'll see them in larger groups, uh, sometimes traveling very quickly at the surface of the water, kicking up a splash. Uh, and they tend to prefer deeper waters, so check them out uh, often in, in the Strait of Georgia. Sometimes you'll see them off the ferry. Pacific white-sided dolphins, also known for their very, very active aerial behavior. Uh, we've had a couple media-worthy reports of them in the Strait of Georgia in, in the thousands. Uh, just last week when I was on the survey, I saw a group of about 500 or so, uh, and it's absolutely incredible. And what you want to look out for them is, of course, those unique markings that you can see on the side and that two-toned, really curved dorsal fin. Killer whales, obviously a very, very iconic species that we can find in BC. I won't go too much uh, into describing what they look like because they are very unique. Uh, what I will point out though is that for those adult male killer whales, those really, really tall dorsal fins that you see can sometimes be taller than I am, up to about six feet, just the dorsal fins. So uh, it's pretty remarkable to see those and certainly keep your eyes out for them uh, when you are on the coast. Moving on to our baleen whales, minke whales. You know, they're kind of similar to harbor porpoises in that they are pretty shy, pretty inconspicuous. They have a, almost like a dolphin-like curved dorsal fin quite, uh, set quite far off uh, on their back there that you can keep your eyes out for. And they also have that really unique white band you can see around their pectoral flippers. Uh, you can actually see that from above the water sometimes. So if you're not sure what you're looking at, you see a whale, uh, make sure to look just around the body underwater as well. Gray whales, I kind of went on about them a, a little bit already. You might be able to tell they are one of my favorites. Um, but that really amazing mottled skin pattern and the lack of dorsal fin. They don't have any dorsal fin at all. Instead, what they have is a set of kind of knuckles that run down their dorsal surface instead. Uh, keep your eyes out for them. We will sometimes see them in shallow waters. In fact, there was one just about this time last year that was hanging out uh, just off Stanley Park for a couple, um, a couple weeks, which made my lunchtime breaks really awesome. Humpback whales also becoming more commonly seen, especially in the inside waters between uh, the mainland and Vancouver Island as they continue to recover from historic whaling. Uh, we have seen huge aggregations of humpbacks in the Strait of Georgia this year, so if you're uh, on the water, please do keep your eyes out. Uh, and fin whales, I threw them in just because they're awesome. You don't really tend to see them around Vancouver, although there has been one spotted near the San Juan Islands this year, which has been really exciting. Generally, they're offshore, um, but if you're basically see a minke whale that looks like it's been doing steroids, that's going to be your fin whale. 
So now that you're all cetacean identification experts, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to get out there, get outside, explore our amazing coastlines, look for cetaceans. You never know when you might see one. And when you do see one, you have to report it. You can be that marine biologist that you always wanted to be. There are a number of ways that you can do that. Uh, we have an online web form on our website, our toll-free hotline. You can email anytime. And we also have our new, shiny, brand new smartphone application. Uh, it's called Whale Report. It's the quickest, the easiest way uh, to observe things. And you always have your cell phone with you, so there's no excuse not to report, but it does make it very easy. Because you just never know what you might see. This is a leaping Pacific white-sided dolphin seen in Howe Sound. You can even see the Sea to Sky Highway in the background of the photo. Amazing. If you recognize this boat ramp, that's actually Granville Island. And take a look at the center of the frame. There's a gray whale right there. And if you're really lucky and you head offshore, just like I did, you might see something like this. Hundreds of Pacific white-sided dolphins mixed in with a really kind of cool species called northern right whale dolphins, pretty much stretching for as far as the eye can see. This is one of my favorite memories of the last couple of years and makes me feel so fortunate to be in the position that I am on the same cruise, right outside my porthole window, two fin whales, the second largest animal on Earth. BC is amazing. Thanks so much. Thanks again for listening. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to learn more about cetacean identification, I brought along uh, some brochures that do have an ID guide in the middle. Pretty handy for taking.